as in the rest of the world, we've seen a very sharp increase in dis disinformation and fake news in Europe, a phenomenon reinforced since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. Europe both became a specific target and saw the rise of skeptic movements within the continent in the wake of the COVID pandemic and the vaccines campaign. General trust in governments, health authorities, science, scientists decreased sharply in a context which already saw a high level of defiance towards politicians uh, and politics, generally speaking. Polarization of the public debate has never been so high. Is it mainly due to misinformation, manipulation, and if so, who by? If the specific role of social media as an amplifier is widely acknowledged, what role did the traditional media play in the whole in this whole phenomenon? Is it for sure? It's for sure, uh, uh, as I said, a very delicate subject, and um, we also want to know whether the three of you uh, have had some problems researching on it or publishing on the subject, because sometimes we we, we do as journalists, of course. Um, we have therefore published a series of, of uh, well-researched articles and interviews on the various aspects of these cons conspiracy theories in Europe. We want to thank you, the three of you, very warmly for having accepted to be with us tonight and to present your analysis on this phenomenon and a major threat to democracy, we think. So uh, let uh, Jan Paolo ask the first question to Andreas. Yes, uh, Professor Enerfors, um, so you, you wrote a book uh, quite uh, recently, Your Continent of Conspiracies, and you, you also published a recent report um, more focused on, on Sweden. So what are your main findings uh, on the, the state of the art of uh, the relationship between European citizens and conspiracies, in a few words? Yeah, a few words, Sissa. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here with you tonight. And uh, first, I should point out that the book uh, Europe Continent of Conspiracies has a, a, a co-publisher, um, a co-editor, Andre Krover from, from the Netherlands. And uh, I think what I want to have said with that is that we are, we have joined forces in trying to analyze the situation from the humanities, social sciences, uh, um, psychology, um, media studies across the board in order to get a better understanding of what is going on. And uh, uh, the first thing that, that one could mention is, of course, that uh, uh, it is worth reflecting on Europe itself as an entity. And what we, what we are saying in the book, for instance, is that, that uh, is a history of ideas. There is an intellectual history of uh, Europe imagine itself as being in decline. We have, for instance, Oswald Spengler. We have also others who, who have this idea of that, of that the Western civilization always is some kind of under attack, and that's an idea that goes back to the uh, you know old uh, um, myths about the the fight between uh, Greece and the Persian Empire, uh, for instance. So, so we we have already an idea about our continent that is charged with the idea of decline, and we are placed in the kind of psychology of external enemies, but also internal collaborators that makes the situation so specific in Europe. So that if you simply exchange the actors of, of conspiratorial narratives, let's say uh, in, in the Middle Ages with today, we have a shift from antisemitism that goes to Islamophobia, uh, but still antisemitism very, very much alive. And, and on the side of external enemies, we have always the external other which in, in, in former times was the Osman Empire um, um, and today is more in general the, the, the Muslim world. And I think that captures one big finding that we see that the situation in, in, in Europe is charged with the imagination of external enemies and internal uh, traitors. Um, and then this theme could be discussed and addressed in a number of phenomena as we do in our book. It can relate to how far right politics and populist parties are getting uh, um, support in Europe. And that is what we are doing in the book. Uh, we are looking at how uh, conspiracy theorists have nurtured uh, um, terrorist manifestos, for instance, in Germany, that was a chapter that I wrote, uh, for instance. And we can see how media discourses have been um, uh, influenced and how uh, you were asking the question of mainstream media 
how also conspiracy theories as advanced narratives of disinformation have um, influenced the news cycle of also of the traditional media uh, and pushed uh, the limits of what is able to be 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 reported on uh, and said in uh, in, in the media today. So that is a very short <laughs> analysis, Jan Paul. I'm sorry that I, I cannot be a, even shorter uh, with that. Um, Thank you. No, but we, we, we'll get back to that, uh, to, to your point uh, a bit later. But we, we need to, make, to have a time for everyone to, to speak um, and for the discussion to be a bit dynamic. Sure. Uh, yeah, keep your <laughs> ideas because we'll get back to you as soon as uh, uh, you ask two more questions. <laughs> Okay, I have now a quick question for Peggy. Peggy, uh, hello, and thanks for being here. Uh, Peggy, you carried out an investigation about the QAnon phenomenon last summer we, that we, we published actually on Vox Europe. And what, what ingredients made it become so popular in Europe, in particular in Germany, when it soon became the second largest group after the US? Well, um, yes, that's exactly uh, that was the, the goal of my investigation. And I wanted uh, to analyze the chronology of QAnon's arrival in Europe and the, indeed the, the key factors um, which have uh, speed up the, the, the spreading of, the, of QAnon and which have constituted a, a fertile ground for, for these theories. And I think that there's been there are several factors. One of them is um, is the far right, the presence of the far right in each country where it has emerged. There's the far right, which has helped QAnon arrive in Europe, in Western Europe above all. And um, for instance, in France, it's, um, it's uh, an, an Amer um, uh, far right Canadian YouTuber called uh, Alexis Cossette Trudel who has uh, translated the conspiracy theories of uh, QAnon in French. And that's how it started uh, way, getting widespread in, um, in France. In Germany, you have someone like uh, the far right activist, Oliver Janisch. Um, and you also have some existing movement like uh, the Reichsburger, which is a conspiracy uh, movement, which states that uh, the Reich still exists and is threatened by uh, the German state. Um, also in Italy, uh, QAnon is widespread in, in the far right branch of the church. So it's quite often the far right, which has been um, a way to enter Europe. Then you have also history and local context. Because as one of the um, researchers that I interviewed, uh, her name is um, uh, Peltier. I can't remember the person. It's my, Mrs. Peltier. She says that QAnon um, provides a, a meta narrative, which is like uh, an idea, a framework idea, which is usually anti establishment uh, and which involves quite often. Um, uh, conspiracy around the, the elite running uh, pedophile uh, ring. And so th there's this framework in which the local, some local um, events can fit and history also can fit. For instance, in Germany, um, Germany has been freed by, um, by the, the Americans from uh, dictatorship. And so there's this idea which, which is going to arrive quite soon because in Germany, the, as you said, um, it has become the second largest group in Europe. And so we can find traces of QAnon as soon as um, uh, as of 2018. And the idea was that um, the Germans are going to be freed by uh, Donald Trump from uh, Angela Merkel and uh, Angela Merkel and the and the German state. And uh, also, you have so some local um, events like, the, for instance, the Yellow Vest are going to be a, a movement where. QAnon is going to be able to widespread its conspiracy, conspiracy theories because the Yellow Vest are a movement against the elite, against the establishment. Or you have some, some scandal like the Epstein scandal, which is a, a scandal of, uh, which has a, a French connection, which is the um, uh, Jean, Jean-Luc Brunel, who was the owner of a model agency and who has abused some young models and uh, who was a colleague of uh, Epstein. On this basis, you have QAnon, which uh, managed to widespread its theories and um, and to adapt itself to each country. Here you 
thank you. Thank you, Peggy. So it's something to be uh, quite uh, afraid of. Well, th there's a country which doesn't need QAnon conspiracy uh, theories to, um, to focalize against uh, uh, a specific target, a specific person who is uh, accused of being responsible for uh, everything that goes bad there and in Central Europe as a whole. And this is Hungary. And this is why we We've asked uh, Georgi to um, write a, a piece for us on uh, the, let's say, the, the, the big uh, bogeyman that has been um, around Hungary, according to, of course, conspiracists and, and far right uh, theorists. Georgi, uh, how come that all those theories against Georg so Joe so Soros? Uh, who is of Hungarian origins, the, the US uh, billionaire, have become so popular and, and can spread so easily in, uh, in Hungary. And when do these theories uh, date back? I have to unmute you. I did it before. Can you hear me now? Yeah. I couldn't unmute myself, sorry. So, uh, <clears throat> well, honestly, um, George Soros is just um, one puzzle of the whole um, disinformation approach, so to say, or informal disinformation approach of the Hungarian, I don't know if it's the state, the deep state, the, the government, or all in all, the Hungarian public sphere, because Hungary spends, uh, well, if we, if we, um, understand uh, in a wider scope uh, what is this information that I would consider the whole Hungarian public broadcaster and public media company with its 30 plus million euros annual budget to be spent on this information because if if you ever try to consume if you if you had the chance to know Hungarian and if you try to consume the Hungarian public broadcaster's content it's it's I mean I, I lived only the last few years of the communism but they would be super jealous that such propaganda could be produced I'm, and I'm really meaning this because the, the quality of especially TV news with their messaging the way they speak about migrants permanently and repeatedly and and um, without any 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 found any grounds for reality uh, is exceptional and they do the same about all kinds of minority groups they do this against uh, um, uh, lgbt groups they do this uh, with other other um, for smaller fractions of the society who they target for different reasons uh, to be named and shamed or just expelled from the public debate or discredited so this is a daily practice in the Hungarian uh, public broadcaster. And there is a lot of also pro-government financed, uh, pro-government businessman financed, I don't know how to say it nicely, uh, publications. I mean, now, uh, the numbers are hundreds of these in Hungary that are pushing similar agendas. They are questioning what is what is reality, what is, what is hard news, what is not, how we speak about uh, complex issues, how we try to push to very simplified messages uh, uh, in the name of, and, and often the best part of course with this is that they say, oh, the other side is doing this information. Well, whatever they say is, has no grounds of reality whatsoever. So Hungary is a very partic uh, particular, uh, country now today in the European Union where this information basically comes from official sources so to say which I think is even though there are some similar attempts in some other member states I'm aware then maybe in Slovenia some attempts in Poland and some other uh, countries they tried to mingle with this but the scale the volume of funding available for this including what they push for example on the the latest example is really good the the there is a pre-election that took place the last months in hungary for the for the opposition to find one common uh, prime minister candidate for next april's election there the uh, the the disinformation what happened against all the candidates and they were all 
uh, attached to one foreign, one really hated uh, ex prime minister Gyurc, Ferenc Gyurcsány, and the the government strategy is whoever would be the candidate, they would just try to bind him with Ferenc Gyurcsány and then discredit him, and whatever is truth or not truth, they use all kinds of manipulative techniques, and this happened in uh, in. I think hundreds of thousands of not I think I read about this hundreds of thousands of euros worth of uh, Facebook ads budget in the last few months only for these candidates but that's just one of the recent examples I don't know if this somehow compasses what I what what is the situation in Hungary uh, uh, you haven't spoken spoke much about uh, Georg Soros. He's uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I haven't done that. Now, the, the thing is that he's now a little bit of an old record, so to say, because he they tried to use him on and on and bring and and rewind the same vinyl and rewind the same vinyl, but uh, but uh, lately it doesn't work that well anymore people that it doesn't trigger people that well as before and why was he was such a great um uh target for for uh, being shamed named and shamed for everything in hungary is there are several things that he's hungarian that he's for a liberal society and he's he's value-based that wish Jewish origin, right? Uh, and that, uh, and then some other factors that were ideal to 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 uh, that contributed ideal to 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 be to become the scapegoat of um, of everything that that's wrong in the country. Okay, okay thanks, thanks a lot. Yeah. Uh, we will you'll get a chance to talk again, of course. Uh, I go back to Andreas uh, now. Um, I have two questions in one. Really, is uh, what links do you see between the rise of the different conspiracy theories and, and the populist movements? And can you see already an impact? That, has it had an impact on the German elections last September? And do you see any influence of these uh, theories or groups in the run-up of the pre presidential elections in France? I cannot comment on, on the situation in France. I can comment more on the situation in Germany. I think I'd like to uh, connect to what uh, Jerzy said about the situation in Hungary as well, because we are touching upon something very interesting here, and namely what who is expressing uh, the disinformation and the conspiracy theories. In the report that, uh, uh, that was shared by Gianpaolo, uh, I, I make a distinction between, between four usages. One is that is this conspiracy theories, disinformation is used top down from um, people who are in power to uh, denigrate their political opponents and to mobilize uh, support. Uh, and we have seen that in, in the United States, we've seen it in Hungary. The other is of course, when conspiracy theories come from, from, from bottom up, where they are real expression of frustration and unrest and that is something we should be very um we, we should we should at least uh, try to understand it why that happens because that is a social pressure that often uh, generates an acceptance of the conspiracy theories and disinformation to answer your question first what populist actors frequently do is to to take that popular frustration uh and, and and portray themselves as the speakers, as the mouthpieces of that marginalized uh, population. So us versus the experts, the experts are wrong. We have the power to uh, question whatever experts are saying, whatever expert knowledge is, because we have read it somewhere, we have done our research. Uh, so in the German case, just to, to answer shortly upon that question, we have seen that the polarization in the German electorate is still very strong. We have a new possibly center-left liberal uh, government in Germany forming uh, the Ampel Coalition, but we see that there are deep entrenched pockets in the Eastern uh, German electorate, particularly where the populist movement Pegida was strong and, and was uh, building up support since 2014 that now are uh, in majority voting for uh, Alternative für Deutschland, which is a right-wing populist party. So there are uh, reasons behind that that need to be studied more carefully. 
um, but um, they relate to the factors I was mentioning before. Uh, AfD and Pegida are, are uh, identified as speaking for these uh, masses of people that seem themselves as unrepresented the current uh, current um, political landscape. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. Jan do you carry on with another question? Yeah, sure. Um, Piggy, uh, you, you spoke um, before, uh, you mentioned it, the, the, some movements that are very popular in, in quite popular in France uh, lately, uh, knowing that France is one of the countries in Europe with the, the most, the, the largest, what they call vaccine resistance, meaning people that don't want to get vaccinated against COVID-19. Uh, is there any, have you found any link between uh, the, the anti-vax sentiment, the COVID uh, skepticism and some uh, conspiracy theories in, um, in France? Peggy yeah. still here. Ah, yes, ah. There was the, the mic was, uh, was ah. up. Yes, and actually that's how um, actually the, 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 extra, the far right joined actually the, the, the far left. It's through the, through the, the pandemic and the, the protest and the anti-vax movement. And um, actually, you, what I explained in the, in the in the paper, it's that uh, after the, the climax of the QAnon um, presence in Europe has been spring 2020, and then uh, then you're going to have the Facebook and Twitter, which are going to close uh, some accounts, and QAnon are going to go into a clandestinity somehow. They're going to hide behind some strategies to, uh, and above all, they're, they're going to enter some um, some smaller groups, some groups which are um, for alternative medicine or some new age groups, and uh, it will all um, and it will converge with the, some protest anti 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 lockdown anti coronavirus. Um, some protests against the restrictions uh, for the for the coronavirus, for instance, in Germany is going to be quite important. There's a protest in August 2020 with um, where you will have uh, Andreas. You told it in the interview you, you, where you will see some some uh, climate activists working walking next to some uh, skinhead or far right. Um, activist and uh, so it's the same in france the anti-vax movement is um, is um, is is com is made of different uh, people coming from di different different part of the political spectrum and also of the society and qanon has entered this network and is now acting in a more um, in a less obvious way, without without being called QAnon as it's a, as as a, as, a, as such. Okay, thank you, Peggy. I, I I'm go I'm about to ask you a question. Actually, that was um, uh, written down by Adrian. I'm asking you the question now because I know you might not be able to answer it as you're leaving at eight uh, for Channel Four. So I'll read you the question. I was really surprised by the appearance of QAnon in Germany and France. I thought that it was a very American theory and that it could not hold in Europe. Do you think that some theories are too specific to spread outside their birthplace? Or do you think any theory can grow and always find footing anywhere? Actually, this question could be answered by the three of you as well, <laughs> for Germany and for, for um, uh, also well, from Georgia, yeah. yeah. Andreas, I'm sure, has, has a yeah. idea of this because yeah. I, I focused on QAnon, so Andreas, you, you have... Thank you. Yeah, and I was uh, actually already giving an answer in the chat that I can share with, with you all, and that is that some of the conspiracy theories are culture-specific. For instance, most people across the globe are not very interested in conspiracy theories related to the death of our Swedish Prime Minister Olaf Palme in 1987, or the sinking of the ferry Estonia in 1994. So these are conspiracy theories that are about the deep state, but they are very specific to a Swedish context. 
Whereas 9-11 opened up for a kind of new global dissemination of, of conspiracy thoughts and established clear links between the Atlantic and Europe. Mm -hmm. and, and QAnon, of course, is a very culture specific in, in one way, but on the other hand, a story that you can recognize in another context as well. Because you can see there's a grain of truth, some powerful men who are abusing their position, uh, who are abusing children sexually, and then you have the can can build a, concoct the same a similar story. What what strikes me is are the the structural similarities between certain conspiracy narratives between Europe and and, and the United States that have to be uh, investigated closer. For instance, don't forget that the first storm against a, a building of representative democracy not was the Capitol but the Reichstag in Berlin in August 2020 when the Reichsbürger uh, uh, stormed the, uh, the stairs of, of, of the Bundestag. And also AfD parliament members who admitted people from Reichsburg to the parliament building to arrest parliament members. So that is the, the case. The Reichsburg Bewegung has in its ideas adapted ideas from America, from the so-called sovereign citizens movement, which is an extremely libertarian almost, but also conservative interpretation of constitutional law and, and what citizens have the right to do and not. So we have these transatlantic links. And what I'm saying is that QAnon is a story that, that is spread and disseminated globally, such as the 9-11 stories, and you can transport it to another context and make it relevant even there. Yeah? And that is, uh, that is what, what I, I, I would say here. But then, of course, it would be interesting to hear if, for instance, in Hungary, the QAnon conspiracy theory plays any role, and if, if, if yes, uh, in, in, what, in what way? Well, from what I, I found uh, talking to people is that the QAnon are not that widespread in uh, Central and Eastern Europe, because, well, what I was told in Poland, for instance, is that uh, conspiracy is, um, targets more the Russians. And uh, so it's the QAnon didn't, I mean, when I talked to, when I did my interviews, there were QAnon, QAnon was not that widespread. Apart from that, I have nothing to add to what you say. There's, as I said, there's this meta narrative which can be implemented in each country, where in each country you all, you already have some, uh, some, some basis for, for conspiracy theories. Yeah. Um, so maybe no um, no invasion of the parliament in uh, in Hungary from the outside, but from the inside, uh, uh, and, and using the tools of uh, formal democracy, um, maybe. Well, uh, Georgi, um, is is QAnon popular in uh, in Hungary? And if not, are there any? Is there any conspiracist movement uh, which is popular in Hungary? No, in general, Hungary, the main influence, as I see it, especially that I do speak Russian, is that <clears throat> the Russians try to manipulate the public sphere quite often with different messages and different uh, attempts to, to uh, spread uh, non-accurate news or interpret facts that in, in, in non-true ways. That's more of an issue. What was... Uh, there, there is some, actually the, the, the vaccination statistics that are going down since the end of well, like mid-summer uh, is partly related to the people's general uh, distrust to authorities and especially healthcare and uh, authorities. And the same goes on in Russia. If you look around and if you see the, the, the statistics, what they do is that uh, if, if you push too many, um, to re reiterate all the time <clears throat> false messages people's trust general trust in politics and in uh, in the public debate also lowers and lowers and lowers to the point where they for example don't take up their jobs uh, don't take their vaccines don't uh, trust uh, to different uh... in hungary how they did this for example vaccine related is that the, with the early introduction of the sputnik and the china sinopharm vaccines and and after that only figuring out that their effic efficacy is efficiency is much lower um, or significantly lower and they they generally started to the to to push disbelieving people and today 
Hungarians in large numbers are not picking up their med uh, in their vaccines. And in, in Russia, this effect was even way more stronger. And now if you look at the current statistics, what's happening now in Russia, COVID terms, it's really, really bad. So the effect is definitely there because there are a lot of people dying. There is like almost a million sick people in, in right now in Russia, like over 750,000, I think so. And that's mainly because it, the Russian authorities did their best to, to uh, make people believe less that the COVID is a serious threat, that it can be deadly, that it can, and that there, there is an effective vaccine or there are several, sorry, several effective vaccines. Yeah, this is a pattern that we have so that we've seen in uh, several uh, Central and Eastern uh, European countries. Uh, Belarus, uh, for example, uh, mm -hmm. um, is the same. Um, listen, Georgi, uh, is is the the anti Soros um, feeling and, and the the, uh, the, the, the let's say the, the believing in conspiracy theories in Hungary? Also associated with uh, uh, anti-Semitism, a, a long lineage of uh, anti-Semitic anti myths and stereotypes. Is there any kind of resurgence of anti-Semitism in Hungary? Yeah, a lot of official or half-official communication blurs the line between hate speech and uh, xenophobia or or, or um, anti-Semitism and and real public debate. So that there's no surprise that. First of all, Hungarians traditionally are more xenophobic than I think the other countries in the region. I don't know statistics by heart, but uh, <clears throat> there's definitely a bigger. Um, that this is why, for example, it's it's easier to to push anti-migrant uh, uh, arguments in the Hungarian media when it comes to the Muslims or when it comes to influx of North Africans or whatever they say they claim and uh, people are less perceptive about uh, saying stop this shouldn't be like this they are all humans and we should take care of all other humans in a, in a human way so uh, yes in Hungary um, there is more more um, the, oh, sorry, the uh, um, xenophobia and, and the anti-Muslim Muslim and anti-Jewish statements are spreading easier than in other countries in Europe, in my understanding, or in my experience. Okay. Thank you, Georgia. Uh, so, Andreas, you, you wave. Yes. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Please. Yeah. <laughs> If I can, <laughs> exactly. If I can jump in here, because I think that's sure. a very... Uh, a relevant question that Gian, Gian Paolo is asking. Uh, and the first and obvious one is, of course, to connect uh, 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 the pandemic with the evil manipulation of uh, uh, the, the eternal uh, George Soros and, and other actors. And that's the most obvious one. But there are also more sublime messages that are spread in connection with COVID-19. Uh, because anti-COVID protesters have been seen across Europe wearing the yellow star of the Jews. Mm -hmm. And in pseudo-Hebrew letters, it is written uh, not vaccinated or ungeimpft or, and so on in many countries in different languages. So this identification of the people uh, with the, the Jews during the Third Reich and the occupied countries across uh, Europe uh, as being exposed uh, to the machinations of a totalitarian state that is uh, um, that is one way of a sublime anti-Semitist message. They are, so to speak, uh, reverting the uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the 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 relationship between uh, a totalitarian regime and, uh, and those who are oppressed and persecuted by it and killed by it. Uh, that is one thing. The other sublime thing is that they are saying. It is not a vaccine we are getting because it has not gone through the trial phase. Mm -hmm. It is an unauthorized medical experiment. Ergo, it goes against the Nuremberg laws that were taken after the Second World War. Ergo, uh, those states who are administering this so-called vaccine uh, are actually uh, war criminals or criminals, cr criminals against humanity and can be likened with the Nazi regime. So that is a very horrible abuse of the victim situation, I would say. And then we have kind of obvious references or obvious reemergence of, of, uh, of anti-Semitism connection with COVID-19. And uh, John Paolo, you maybe know about the uh, 
uh, Italian artist uh, Gasparro, who is uh, who has uh, um, uh, re uh, um, uh, reestablished, so to speak, uh, the, uh, the the richer murder narrative in in his uh, in his art by depicting how Jews are killing a, a Christian boy, uh, Simon of Trent. And if you look at the of, of the image that this guy Gasparo has published on his Facebook, it was taken down, of course, and he accused Facebook of, of totalitarianism and so on, is that the, the instruments with which, with, with which they torture this Christian boy are very similar to, uh, um, to syringes that are used in, in vaccination. So there are a lot of different narratives around from pointing out Soros as the arch manipulator to this yellow star, to the Nuremberg law thing, and to um, a revival of old anti-Semitic stereotypes like ritual murder, as in the art of Gaspar. So I think that's a, a very uh, frightening uh, phenomenon that we can see right now. Thank you, Andreas. That was a question actually I, I, I meant to ask. Uh, uh, Georgie, uh, maybe I'll ask it now and then I'll get back to you, Andreas, with a question about Sweden I, I wanted to ask you. Uh, I, was, I was wondering, uh, Georgie, uh, whether, as we talk about anti-Semitism, uh, mm -hmm. whether you think there's a revival of it, if I may say, call it that, that way, um, uh, recently or not? You mean in Hungary? Hungary in, I would not say that it's a revival. That. It's okay. historically higher than in in other countries in the region because Hungary is facing with its history it was never complete, never like, never even systematic. There's, for example, state secrets still not officially <clears throat> released from, from before the fall of the Iron mm -hmm. Curtain in thousands of dossiers and a lot of uh, agents were not named, for example. So the, the facing with your history part as it took place uh, exceptionally well in Germany or to some extent pretty well in Austria never happened in Hungary uh, in a structured manner, which, which also allows historians and politicians to mix around with the uh, facts and different interpretations of what happened in the past uh, 100 years in Hungary. Mm -hmm. But I would not say that this is a growing trend in, I think in, especially among uh, younger urban uh, Hungarians, especially who by any chance went with Erasmus somewhere or traveled extensively or went had have experience from out, from the outside world, they are less perceptive towards um, hate speech and uh, especially uh, LGBT facing hatred is, is not really popular. This is why, for example, uh, the, the scandal of uh, Joseph Sayer last spring, so, sorry, last fall, you know, are you, you know mm -hmm. what I'm referring to or shall I give a half? The, 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 MEP, the Hungarian MEP who was caught running away with, with, uh, with an ecstasy pill in his backpack from a, from a oh, gay, yeah. Yeah, gay yeah, party yeah. in Brussels. Yeah. Yeah. And police catched him on the, when well, he tried to escape through the window. window. And then he had to resign. But the, the whole, the most ironic part of that story is that he's the, he, he, he is the one of the authors of the Hungarian constitution that black and white wrote into the constitution that a marriage can be only imaginable between man and woman, among other things. And, uh, and um, why was I mentioning this? Uh, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you wanted to say that the uh, LGBTQ issue is really yeah. not. Ah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, that's uh, a, exactly conflict. the example that <laughs> that the, the case of Joseph Sire led to a lot of outrage and ridicule, but but people were not saying that. Oh my God, how horrible is that? There are people who are not uh, interested in in, uh, in the opposite sex. So, but Hungarians are are generation by generation more uh, open, for example, to different sexual uh, approaches, but, uh, but this, it is not really the case Thank when you, it comes Georgie. to minorities. Uh, Andreas, I have a question uh, for you about Sweden, because you, you did, uh, of course, uh, work on it for, for the report you, you published. Um, are conspiracy theories uh, a threat to democracy, to Swedish democracy? Uh, when you, you wrote in the re recent report that these theories prepare the ground for foreign powers, uh, information activities directed at Sweden, could you say a few words about it? 
yeah, sh sure, absolutely. Yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. What we have seen during the anti-COVID protest is number one, that the, uh, a, a global crisis like the pandemic can mobilize to uh, anti-democratic uh, um, support across uh, the political spectrum. That's number one. That's what we said before. But then on the other hand, we have a populist uh, right-wing party in the Swedish parliament. And uh, uh, there are case after case after case for people and, and from that party or supporting the party also share content from, from Russian media uh, uh, or, or from media with no trustworthy source, which very easily can be traced back to the kind of disinformation campaigns, EU versus disinformation or Stratcom and Riga uh, constantly is, is uh, pointing out as uh, being orchestrated from, from the Kremlin. And, and that we have seen in, in a number of Swedish cases over, over the recent years, for instance, during the so-called refugee crisis. Uh, uh, and, and, and we had the forest fires in Sweden. Uh, that was a really, that was an event that really spinned these stories out of control. And, and what they all want to reinforce is that, that the current Swedish government is incompetent to protect its, uh, its citizens. But there's also another dimension. Uh, the other story is the Swedish state is so powerful that it controls all its citizens. So there are two very conflicting narratives around here that you can see uh, and that are disseminated in social media. And that uh, if, you, if you follow uh, the source, uh, free, frequently can be traced back to, to um, uh, uh, Kremlin um, in disinformation campaigns. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Andreas. Uh, a, a question for um, Peggy. No, two questions actually for um, for Peggy before she leaves because uh, she has to leave at eight. So one is, um, what is the influence, as far as you know, of social media in the spreading of uh, conspiracy theories? And of course, Andreas, you can uh, and, and Georgi, you can intervene uh, after Peggy on that if you have something to say. And then there's a question for uh, Peggy by Federico, uh, what would be QAnon's agenda uh, beyond destabilization? Does QAnon have a, an agenda like uh, uh, getting into power or what is it? Um, regarding the social media, it has been, uh, well, it's, it's a key instrument to uh, widespread QAnon in Europe. And for instance, you have seen um, when QAnon changed its strategy and became more um, became went into clandestinity. It was um, in in August, uh, well, during the summer 2020, and they uh, used uh, the hashtag of the uh, NGO uh, Save the Children, mm. and um, and that's how and it became viral on uh, on Twitter. And uh, and uh, it it uh, bring about uh, some demonstrations. Uh, I talked about in the paper about some demonstrations in the UK of people being convinced that there was uh, some child uh, trafficking, and um, and some were not related uh, directly to Ukraine, and they they honestly believe that there was some child trafficking because of this. Uh, social media campaign using the Save the Children um, hashtag. Regarding the agenda. Uh, well, there's a question that I always ask the people I, I interviewed is, is it was, um, are they dangerous? And um, politically, they have not, in Europe, they have not reached the political stage like in the US. Uh, and you have, uh, for instance, um, a German, um, German um, QAnon activist, which was uh, Michael, uh, a German uh, who who took part, uh, who was at the, um, who launched the, the protest in uh, August 2020, which uh, was uh, where there was a threat of assault of the Reichstag. Uh, it was Michael Balweg, Balweg and um, he ran for a uh, position of, I think it was mayor um, of Stuttgart, and he did a very low, uh, a very low results. He got something like 2.5 percent, so it was not much. And uh, Iris Boyer from the uh, the think tank ISD Global told me that they were not organized and structured enough to to really reach a political mandate. 
and she was more uh, preoccupied of um, of uh, an action of a lone wolf like uh, like uh, Anders Bering uh, D Boring D D Bering did in uh, in Norway, for instance. So this sort of um, radical uh, mass killing. So that's what I found out. Yeah. Okay, uh, Andreas or Georgi, you want to jump in on, on this? Uh, could you rephrase the question? Um, so the, does QAnon have an agenda in uh -huh. Europe? And, and then right. Peggy, the, the, the role of social media, uh, have you got, if you have something uh, to add uh, to what Peggy Thanks. said? Yes, well, uh, exactly. Well, that's an interesting point. And as I said before, if we stick to the model to, to think about conspiracy figures as being top down, bottom up, uh, from inside out and from, uh, no, from outside in and from inside out, I think the main function uh, in, in in the United States context has to be uh, was a tool of uh, top down usage uh, in order to give support to a populist president. We have at the moment not a person, as Peggy said, in Europe that is actively pushing for the conspiracy theory of QAnon to uh, um, denigrate uh, his or her political opponents. But we can see signs that, that the QAnon theory or meta narrative, as Peggy said before, is used in the uh, bottom up mobilization, populist mobilization. Uh, as a tool to denigrate the political elite, so so to speak, and the populist narrative, uh, and and that is an an agenda in itself, because it, you could say the agenda is to to grow support for the populist movements, uh, to um, give their 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 arms in in organized politics more uh, electoral support and so on. We don't know how successful that is uh, and not, and 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 clearly. Uh, the QA not meta narrative can be pushed as a disinformation campaign from the outside in. Uh, we have not seen so much that it is used as a uh, as an um, uh, identification within political movements to self identify as a, as a special QA non movement. But as I said before, we have seen the QA not meta narrative transformed into, for instance, the Reisberger um, story that has very many similarities. Uh, to this sovereign citizens movement and so on. So I think if we need to distinguish on the different levels, uh, but uh, the agenda is basically to undermine representative democracy so much that we have uh, 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 th these very strange situations across European electorates at the moment where we have no clear majorities. Everybody has to fix somehow uh, majorities, apart from a two party systems like in, in, in Britain or, or in the United States. Mm. Um, since you're there, um, Andreas, uh, one of the most popular theories uh, among the European uh, far right is the so-called uh, Great Replacement or Eurasia mm. theory. Uh, to, to put it short, it's the, the idea that there is a, um, a plot for replacing European white Christians by uh, non-white Muslims and uh, the the, the demographic because the demographics of the Muslims are that they would allegedly have a lot of children and then in a, in a, a few generations they would take over Europe. Mm -hmm. um, so are these theories uh, developing, growing, and how is it possible that this is always astonished that demographic demographs and statistics are very clear? There is no mm -hmm. uh, replacement currently happening. So how come they are so popular? I think they are popular because of that uh, uh, imagination of um, Europe being placed into permanent decline that I was talking about at the, at the very beginning, and that you are imagining an external enemy who comes and runs over the continent. That is the kind of goes back into European history. You can go back to the fall of the uh, Roman Empire, you can go back to the controversy between uh, uh, the Greek states and uh, the Persian Empire. Um, so it's, it's always the kind of the, the trope is there that Europe is a continent that is exposed to external enemies who will come and run over the country. Uh, and, and that is, I think, what is what nurtures the Great Replacement Theory. It makes it so popular 
Aquila in, uh, in, in, in Europe. And then, and then of course, uh, in the conspiracy theory, uh, um, to see domestic elites plotting with your arch enemies makes a very good story. So the, what underlies the Eurabia theory is that liberals and feminists for some reason, uh, and also uh, economical elites are plotting together with uh, uh, the Muslim other to achieve uh, um, a, a, this foreign takeover of, of Europe. Um, and of course, also in, um, Jews or even Israel are accused of orchestrating that. For instance, the the uh, the the refugee uh, crisis of 2015, 2016. Um, so that that is and, and it is popular. It is we, we, uh, last week one representative of our of our populist right wing party uh, was excluded from the party because he was talking in a net forum about uh, creating Swedish majority zones so that the soon to be minority Swedes, ethnic Swedes could have some kind of reservation in which they could live and so on. And let's not forget that your Christchurch attack was motivated by that. And that um, uh, uh, the German terrorist attack of Hanau also was motivated by, by these ideas uh, concocted by Renaud Camus. And that we now have a French potential presidential candidate if I understand it correctly who also is uh, singing from the same sheet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, what I, jump in on that. yeah. That's, that's what I was about to say, is that uh, with uh, Eric Zemmour, who is not yet mm. a candidate, but behave, behaves as such, there's the, for the first time, the theory of the great replace, replacement is reaching the almost the mainstream that's debate. Cool. Mm -hmm. And it has been, um, for instance, the, the Rassemblement National, so the French far right, traditional far right, had, was, um, was reluctant to use it and to talk about it officially. And for the first time after Eric Zemmour mentioned it, one of the Rassemblement National's official uh, spoke about it for the first time in a media. So the, 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 the theory is going to be more and more, um, is reaching the political stage and the mainstream debate, which is quite worrying. Mm. And above all, uh, Eric Zemmour says that it's not a conspiracy theory. He says it's reality, of course. Yeah, but where does he, where does he take his facts, his, his, uh, his data? There is no data uh, confirming this. Well, I'm sure that, uh, I mean, you can, uh, I, I think it has, there was a debate, it was not fact checked, but uh, he, he can always produce some facts in some way and just lie, you know, he it's just never about the facts we have to. Yeah, um, it, he, never, he never use fact, he uses always the, the ground, the, the ground history of France, and he will uh, Build a story on on the on, on some key elements of French history that he interpret and translate in his own way. I know you have uh, to. Sorry. Yeah, I'm going. No, to, yeah, I'm I going was to. just going to thank you, Big, because I know I know you need to leave, and it's a yes. pity because we could have uh, we could have carried on, of course, about how the how the media should behave. I mean, of course, Zemmour is all over the place, you know, not only on C News in France, but now, uh, all I'm over working, the channels. And I'm working on it with a, a British television. And why did they come to France? Because in a poll, he, he has reached the second round of the in, in a survey. He's a, he he reaches the second round of the presidential election. So it becomes a phenomenon with her, which has to be covered but before that, indeed. That's a creation of, of the media. Yeah, it's like, uh, that's, that brings mm. in other questions. <laughs> but just, just to coming back to the facts question of Jean Paolo, that in, in this information, the... ciao Peggy. <laughs> Bye Peggy. Ciao Peggy. Yeah. Thanks a lot. It's, uh, it's always about this toxic mixture, but Andreas probably can tell this better, but it's about this toxic mixture where you have one tiny element of truth, and then uh, as it is explained, all the rest or most of the rest of the information package is made up or mostly made up, or maybe it sounds a little bit like truth, but it's definitely not the whole mixture. And that's, that's how they, they 
they grab people's attention and this is how often me the media is responsible too because fact checking everything all the time is very laborsome it, it requires a lot of work there are less and less journalists paid force and worse in europe let's be honest this, this is not a eastern european phenomenon but all, all in all a publisher's problem all across the landscape globally and um, and since there's less um, uh, there are less journalists who, are, who can dedicate enough time to fact check things it's very often the case that the the whole presentation of with a slight truth in it loads as a as a as a good information bomb and then spreads itself as a good meme in the one one or two public spheres <laughs>